March 3rd here in this part of the world. Korea is slowly transitioning from social restrictions to individual responsibility as it seeks a steady path beyond the pandemic. We start now with the broader pandemic coverage. I have Kwon Soa standing by. So I hear Korea's daily tally has noted a slight decline today. All right, Sunny. This Thursday, numbers have gone down to below 200,000 after we experienced an all-time high on Wednesday. 198,803 cases were tallied as of 12 a.m., and that marks a slight drop in both domestic transmissions as well as cases from abroad. Uh, but as we are experiencing higher numbers than a week ago, the average in the past week now has surpassed 170,000. Now for a closer look at uh, where the most cases have occurred, uh, now while most of the places in the country have experienced a drop this Thursday from the day before, uh, in China, and also Daegu as well as Gwangju and Jeollanam-do province are places that have uh, reported higher infections than on Wednesday. Now meanwhile, Korea has posted its highest ever number of single deaths with 128 people having lost their lives in the past day. The earlier uh, record high was 114 a day. And uh, moving over to the number of patients that remain in critical or severe condition, this number has also gone up slightly from the day before, standing in the 700s now for the fourth straight day. Taking a look at our vaccination figures, a little over 2,100 people and more than 4,200 people got their first or second dose of COVID-19 vaccine a day before. And uh, we've now got 31.5 million of the population or 61.5% who have received an additional dose. And uh, globally, there are now an accumulated uh, number of 440 million COVID-19 infections with a similar increase in cases from the day before. The same goes uh, for fatalities. Now, there's uh, been another rise in cases lately in the UK, which has now hit 19 million infections in total. And Germany at 15.1 million has posted close to 200,000 infections in the past day as of noon Korea time. And we see uh, Vietnam has become the country with the 20th highest caseload in the world at 3.7 million. Uh, so with that has surpassed South Africa, uh, not anymore being in the top 20. And Korea now is right below Vietnam, having the 21st highest caseload in the world. And those are the general updates I have for now, but I'll be back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so I thank you for the global tallies over the past 24 hours. Now, back here on the local front, despite the slight decline in the daily tally, authorities remain on high alert over the spread of the so-called stealth Omicron here on the local front. For more, I have Kim bo -Gyung in the studio with me. bo -Gyung, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Sunny. So let's begin with the presence of the stealth Omicron here on the local front. Well, health authorities say they are keeping a close eye on BA2 subvariant of Omicron or stealth Omicron as it is being called. Researchers say this variant is believed to be more contagious than the original Omicron strain and BA2 infections are rising both domestically and abroad. In Korea, among locally transmitted cases, the detection rate for the BA2 version Omicron rose to more than 10% in the fourth week of February compared to just 1% in the first week of that month. When it comes to imported cases, the share of BA2 infections has risen to more than 18% from 10. When looking abroad, stealth Omicron has already become the dominant strain in countries like Denmark, China and India. Health authorities say they will keep a close eye on the BA2 subvariant and to potential impact on the time timeline and the speed of our Omicron peak. However, given that the number of confirmed cases is declining in countries where BA2 transmission rates are high, that is, there are some room for early optimism. Right. Bogyong, yesterday, that would be Wednesday, was the first day of the new school year for students here. Tell us a bit about the Education Ministry's latest guidelines to ensure safety within the academic arena. Well, Sunny, the Ministry is recommending that students use self-diagnosis mobile app to report uh, their health conditions with health authorities. And more than 83% of students in kindergarten, elementary, middle and high school took part in self-screening. Among them, less than 2.7% were advised not to go to to school. The ministry is also operating makeshift PCR screening centers for students and staff and providing rapid antigen test kits for self-testing purposes.
As planned, we have secured 6,060,000 rapid antigen testing kits for the first week of March and provided one for each student. The second week's supply of 13 million will be given to students and faculty members by March 4th. Right, and speaking about rapid antigen tests uh, kits here in the country, Pogyang, there are concerns that they're not as reliable nor as accurate as a PCR test, especially when used by a person who is not a trained medical professional, right? That's right, Sunny. There are many people who got negative test self-test results only to test positive later at a doctor's clinic using the same rapid antigen test. The Korean Society for Laboratory Medicine says rapid antigen testing only has a detection rate of only 20% when self-administered and 50% if done by medical staff. Experts say detecting the virus at an early stage of infection requires samples from deep inside the nose more than 10 centimeters in, but self-test kits can only collect samples from near the nostril. Besides, it is difficult for people who have no anatomical knowledge to administer the test properly. Only those who have a severe runny nose after getting the virus test positive. So it's hard to say if the test kit is very efficient. Positive results come out only three to four days before and after the symptoms show as time passes by and viral loads increase. It is clear that a person is contagious during that space of time. It is also difficult to collect samples all by themselves. Therefore, medical experts recommend these those with symptoms to visit a doctor to get their rapid antigen test. Right, I see. In the meantime, Po Gyeong, I understand that the government here remains determined to ease social restrictions as we enter a new phase in this pandemic. That's right, Sunny. Currently, our social gathering cap of maximum six people and 10 p.m. shutdown orders are due to expire uh, on March 13th. However, the government may not even wait until then to ease its current guidelines as its priority has shifted towards minimizing the number of seriously ill patients and deaths. The government could make an announcement as early as this Friday after consulting with medical experts, business owners and local governments. And its options may include raising the social gathering cap to 8 people and extending business hours to 11 p.m. Right, and you'll probably keep us updated on that. On that, Po Gyeong, thank you for that coverage. Thank you. Right, the World Health Organization saw us says the COVID-19 infections across the globe is on a decline, but there are exceptions, of course, right? Right, Sunny, and unfortunately, Korea is also one of those exceptions, as South Korea, uh, as well as Hong Kong, New Zealand, have been named as some of the key hotspots uh, recently in the past week. And this, as the Western Pacific region was the only place uh, that has seen a rise in infections in the past week, according to an epidemiological report by the World Health Organization in the past week. So over 10 million cases were posted in that span, but uh, that marks a drop for the fourth straight week, and it is also a decline by 16% from the week before. Now, meanwhile, there were also 60,000 new deaths reported, but that's also down by around 10% from the week before. Right, so it is comforting to know that there is a tangible retreat across the globe, but it's also concerning to see that Korea has yet to witness a similar fate. Right, uh, right, Sonny, but uh, Korea appears to be closer now to its Omicron peak. In fact, the WHO assessed a 69% on-week surge in Korea in the past week. However, it marked a decline in the rate of increase because two weeks ago, the surge was at 80% on-week. Now, other countries in terms of the highest caseloads in the past week were Germany, Russia, Turkey, and Brazil. And the U.S., with around 13,000 fatalities, had the highest number of COVID-19-related deaths. Right, I see. And moving forward, so the global health body, I understand, has also called for more aid to Ukraine amid Russia's assault. That's correct. Uh, the head of the WHO on Wednesday especially noted the critical shortage of oxygen in Ukraine amid the crisis and that this 
case will affect health workers' capability in treating COVID-19 patients as well as patients with other health conditions. WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said at least three major oxygen plants in the country have been shut down, which is why the organization is seeking ways to deliver oxygen from neighboring countries and uh, health issues are expected to become a gradual challenge amid more people fleeing Ukraine. Mass population movements are likely to contribute further to transmission of COVID-19, potentially increasing pressure on health systems in neighboring countries. And the latest data by the United Nations says there are already more than 800,000 refugees from this latest crisis. Right, I see. So the WHO, meanwhile, has also backed the use of Merck's antiviral COVID-19 pill. Right. Uh, the, an expert panel of the organization recommended the use of the oral pill for people at high risk. And they made that uh, recommendation on uh, Wednesday. The conditional recommendation was based based on data from six clinical trials involving almost 4,800 patients. Patients with non-severe disease but who are at high risk of hospitalization are included in this group. For instance, the immunocompromised, the unvaccinated, people with chronic diseases and seniors. The panel is also slated to prepare a recommendation for Pfizer's antiviral pill Paxlovid. Meanwhile, as you know, both Merck and Pfizer's treatments have been authorized in the U.S. Uh, already late last year. Right, so and speaking about the U.S., I understand the country has laid out a new COVID-19 exit strategy. Tell us about that. Well, the Biden administration uh, has called on U.S. lawmakers to approve a plan which calls for a new stage of living with COVID-19. The White House unveiled this move on Wednesday, which focuses on a virus strategy that does not disrupt daily lives, while also prepares the country for any new variants that could still emerge. The so-called National COVID-19 Preparedness Plan requires more spending on preparations for potential variants, treatments, and keeping schools and businesses running while continuing to vaccinate Americans as well as the world. The Test to Treat initiative announced by U.S. President Joe Biden during his State of the Union address will be part of the new plan, which would enable people to get tested for COVID-19 at pharmacies and receive free antiviral pills if they test positive. While vaccines, treatments, tests and masks are tools to continuously protect the people, according to a White House COVID-19 coordinator, the country, however, continues to loosen its mandatory mask requirements. On Wednesday, the U.S. Defense and Justice Departments announced face masks at U.S. government agencies are no longer a must. Right, I see. And over in neighboring Japan, so I understand authorities there, like their counterparts here in the country, as Paul Young mentioned earlier, are keeping their eye on the stealth Omicron. Right, uh, the sublineage BA2 uh, of the Omicron, which is known to have a higher transmissibility than the original Omicron variant, is expected to gradually dominate in Japan. While Japan's sixth wave of the coronavirus appears to have passed its peak, the Asai Shimbun cited a local expert who said based on assimilation by April, 74% of COVID-19 cases in the capital, Tokyo, could be the BA2 so-called stealth Omicron. Experts worry this could prolong the current wave. Now, for now, Tokyo has detected at least 30 cases of this subvariant. While Japan is expected to extend its quasi-state of emergency in Tokyo and 14 prefectures, the country is expected to further ease border controls. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said up to 7,000 people will be able to enter a day from the current 5,000. This will especially let more students enter the country. And I believe an announcement is expected to come later this Thursday. All right. So as always, thank you very much for the global updates, Ben. My pleasure.
Stopping our headlines at this hour, intense fighting continues in Ukraine as Russian troops seek to further advance into strategic cities amid undeterred resistance from Ukrainian soldiers. Omjong reports. For seven days, Russian troops have been attacking Ukraine from all directions. Now it seems the first major Ukrainian city has fallen. The mayor of Harrison indicated that the city has been seized by Russian forces. Moscow's defense ministry spokesperson said the Russian military commanders are talking with the administration of the city and region regarding maintenance. Russian armed forces have taken the city of Kherson under total control, civilian infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and public transport work as usual. There is no shortage of groceries or stable goods. In Ukraine's capital city of Kyiv, at least four explosions were reported on Thursday. Two massive blasts hit the city center and two more went off around a metro station. Ukrainian officials say the civilian death toll is already around 2,000. The suffering of Moscow's military has also been brought to light for the first time with Russia's defense ministry admitting Wednesday the extent of casualties it has suffered in the seven days since the invasion. It said 498 Russian servicemen have been killed and almost 1,600 injured. Meanwhile, the UN's nuclear watchdog says Russia has seized control of Ukraine's largest nuclear power plant. The International Atomic Energy Agency revealing the Russian military has gained control of territory around the Zaporozh nuclear power plant, adding the IAEA is talking to all sides in regards to nuclear safety assistance to Ukraine. The important matter here is that when there is a, a, a conflict ongoing, there is of course a risk of attack or um, uh, a, the possibility of an accidental hit. In terms of attack, uh, we do not expect this to happen. I believe that all countries, without exception, are going to be respecting the decisions of the IAEA and the General Conference. Uh, Despite dwindling hope of a diplomatic breakthrough, a second round of Russia-Ukraine talks is set for Thursday. Russian state news agency RIA reports the meeting will be held in Belarus near the country's border with Poland. The first round of talks on Monday lasted about five hours but did not produce any tangible results. Om Jiyong, Arirang News. And in the latest show of global outrage at Kremlin's military campaign in Ukraine, the UN General Assembly has adopted a resolution condemning Russia's appalling aggression. Kim Yosan has more. The UN General Assembly has voted overwhelmingly for a resolution denouncing Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The resolution, backed by 141 of the Assembly's 193 members, was passed Wednesday in a rare emergency session called by the UN Security Council to discuss the Ukraine crisis. It calls for Russia to stop fighting and withdraw its forces immediately, completely and unconditionally. South Korea also supported the resolution, while five countries, including North Korea, Belarus and Syria, voted against. Speaking before the vote, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. stressed that the war must stop. And today, we stand together in holding Russia accountable for its violations of international law and to address the horrific human rights and humanitarian crisis unfolding before our eyes. Meanwhile, the Biden administration detailed a new set of economic sanctions against Russia and its ally Belarus. They include restrictions on Moscow's oil exports as well as sweeping sanctions targeting Russia's defense-related entities. Washington also explained its extension of export control policies to Belarus and preventing the diversion of technology and software to Russia through the country. This, the Biden administration says, will severely limit their ability to obtain the materials needed to support their military aggression against Ukraine. These measures come on the heels of Washington's banning of Russian aircraft from U.S. airspace. Over in Europe, the EU decided to cut Russian banks from the SWIFT payment system on Wednesday. Accordingly, SWIFT said in a statement that it would cut off seven Russian banks from the network from March 12th. The 27-member bloc also banned Kremlin-controlled media outlets from broadcasting into the bloc. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. 
In other news, Korea's per capita income is believed to have jumped more than 10% last year to above 35,000 US dollars, while the economy is seen to have expanded 4% in the year 2021. Min Soo Kyun has details. South Korea's per capita income has risen for the first time in three years as the country recovers from the pandemic-driven economic downturn. Preliminary data from the Bank of Korea on Thursday shows that the country's cross-national income per capita stood at 35,168 U.S. dollars in 2021. South Korea's GNI per capita has been down for two straight years, but last year it bounced back more than 10 percent from a year earlier. The central bank attributed the growth to the nation's economic recovery from the pandemic and the Korean won's appreciation against the U.S. dollar. The latest report also estimates that South Korea's economic growth in 2021 would reach 4 percent, the same as the central bank's earlier forecasts made in January. This is a sharp rise from a year before when the economy dipped 0.9 percent due to the economic fallout from the pandemic. For the fourth quarter, the central bank revised up its estimate by a notch to 1.2 percent, citing better-than-expected exports and economic activities in the service industry. During the October to December period, exports expanded 5 percent on-year, following strong demand for semiconductors, coal and petroleum products, while private consumption increased 1.6 percent from eased virus measures. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. On the political front, there's been a rather dramatic development within the Conservative bloc ahead of early voting slated for tomorrow, that would be Friday. Yoon seok yeol and An chol Su have agreed to a merger, campaign merger that is. Our Lee kyung has the latest. There was very little to hint that Yoon seok yeol of the People Power Party and An chol Su of the People's Party would announce their campaign merger on Thursday morning because it was only last night that they had their last debate before the election where they clashed over a range of issues. But the two candidates reportedly met after the debate at around midnight and tentatively agreed to potentially form a united government through the merger. Then at 8 a.m., the candidates held a joint press briefing where Ahn declared he and Yoon were now, quote, one team. For the future of South Korea and United People's Government, we both make a promise. I support candidate Yoon Song yeol I support the will of candidate An chol Su to create a united people's government and make it a success together. The two sides have decided to co-run the government if Yoon gets elected in all areas in what he calls the united people's government. He also said that the two parties will merge right after the election. The announcement came as a surprise, with the merger thought to be technically over. It was Ahn who initially proposed it, but he later retracted the idea, as neither side could agree on Ahn's proposed holding of a public opinion poll to decide who would ultimately be on the ballot. And just last weekend, the two sides initiated talks, which ultimately broke down. Then tensions rose with both blaming the other for the collapse. To this rather abrupt shift in stance, Ahn said the merger is something that people have been calling for and that he decided solely to respond to that demand for a change of government. Now all eyes are on how this might affect the already tight race between Yoon seok yeol and the Liberal Democratic Party's Lee Jae-myung. The DP also convened an emergency meeting at 8 a.m. and defined the merger as collusion driven by the party's self-interest. Young Eun, Arirang News. Now, in hindsight, some pundits claim the red ties adorned by both Yoon and An during their final debate Wednesday evening may have been a sign of their solidarity. Up next, our Kim Yun Sung covers some of the comments by the four leading candidates on air last night. The last debate before the election. Presidential candidates once again went head to head on Wednesday night in a televised debate hosted by the National Election Commission. The topic? Social issues. Candidates dove straight into their views on South Korea's welfare program. I will implement an employment insurance policy for everybody so people don't have to worry about jobs. I'll also guarantee minimum income through basic income and other benefits. The virtuous cycle between growth and welfare is crucial. Social service welfare contributes more to creating a sustainable virtuous cycle rather than cash handouts. 
There are three important points to remember when it comes to welfare. Building policies by life cycle, ending absolute poverty, and reaching out to find any potential blind spots. A country where we don't worry about hospital bills, housing, income cutoffs, life after retirement, and where the handicapped can be independent and happy. The candidates also clashed heavily on the issue of taxation. If you are a candidate that represents the wealthy, why don't you put more of a tax burden on the rich? Rather than increasing taxes, it would be better if we could cut the temporary budget for short-term economic stimulus. I'm telling you clearly, I do not plan to increase taxes. Candidates also discussed ways to boost the country's chronically low birth rate. Feminism was quickly brought to the fore. Candidate Yoon, you said the reason for our low birth rate is feminism and that because of feminism, men and women don't date. What is feminism in your opinion, and do you still think this way? Feminism is a type of humanism. I think it's about respecting women as humans. Candidate Yoon, I don't understand why shutting down the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family is one of your pledges for young adults, unless you're trying to earn some misogynistic votes by pitting young men and women against each other. Candidates Yoon and An had both been donning red ties during the debate. Viewers said that in hindsight, the similar attire of the two candidates could have been a sign of the merger all along, as a display of a unified front. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. It's that time of the week yet again when we touch upon foreign media coverage of events related to the Korean Peninsula. As always, I have Kim Yeon Seng here. Kim Sung Yeon, that is, here in the studio. <laughs> Sung Yeon, excuse me, welcome back. Great to see you, Sunny. Uh, so today we have international coverage regarding North Korea, also on the Ukraine crisis and how it's affecting North Korea's plan to undermine the South Korea-U.S. alliance. We also have a story on a possible reset of relations between Korea and Japan with a change in political leadership. Uh, and finally on Squid Game, once again making history. So let's dive right in. Eleven countries, including South Korea and the U.S., have denounced North Korea's latest ballistic missile launch, urging the U.N. Security Council to also condemn it as it violates a number of council resolutions. The missile launch was the North's eighth missile test of the year, which was detected on Sunday. The North Korea's state media did not confirm the launch, but instead claimed the country had tested cameras for a reconnaissance satellite. The Associated Press covered the story in detail, mentioning how the Security Council had initially imposed sanctions on North Korea following its first nuclear test in 2016, adding that the Council had always been open to revising, suspending or lifting sanctions if North Korea had followed its demands. The 11 countries this week urged the North to ease regional tensions, stressing they would not give up the pursuit of peace and security. Right, Song Yun, and staying with North Korea, some observers, I believe, are saying that Pyongyang may adopt a more aggressive stance against the Seoul-Washington alliance. Tell us about to that. Right, uh, Sunny, so some experts are saying that the Russian invasion of Ukraine may perhaps prompt uh, North Korea to act more boldly when it comes to its long-term goal of trying to disrupt the alliance between South Korea and the United States. So the Voice of America in its report cited a retired U.S. Army general who said North Korean leader Kim Jong-un could seize on the Ukraine-Russia crisis to test the alliance between Seoul and Washington. The VOA says that despite a mutual defense treaty that obligates the U.S. to defend Korea in the event of war, President Biden's decision not to send American forces to defend Ukraine may be seen as a weakness to Pyongyang. And it explained that North Korea has long tried to break the Seoul-Washington alliance, which sees U.S. military 
presence in South Korea as part of a hostile policy against the North Korean regime. So the VOA in the meantime added that pro-alliance sentiments in Korea have deepened with the unfolding of the Ukraine crisis by reminding the public here of the importance of the Seoul-Washington alliance as well. Also on the diplomatic front, Song and some pundits are betting on prospects of a new chapter in Seoul-Tokyo ties. Tell us about that as well. Well, that is what some observers are expecting, Sunny. Um, I did come across an interesting piece regarding Seoul-Tokyo relations, talking about the prospects of a reset of bilateral relations, especially uh, with a new Japanese leader at the helm and also a new Korean president uh, about to be elected. The East Asia Forum said that bilateral relations have been at their lowest in decades due to recent historical disputes, but changing political landscapes in both countries have opened the door to a possible shift in their relationship. The paper noted that most democratically elected Korean presidents uh, have advocated a forward-looking approach on Korean-Japan relations, adding that the same applies to Japanese leaders. It further highlighted that the leaders have an important role in shaping bilateral relations and that it will be helpful to keep historical issues off the summit tables in the future. Hence, it suggested President Moon's successor and his Japanese counterpart, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, to discuss historical issues through separate diplomatic channels instead of at summit meetings. Moreover, the paper stressed that the two sides should not resort to retaliation using economic defense or cultural means. All right, let's end our segment today, Song Yan, with more coverage of Squid Game, which has been making or continues to make history. Yes, certainly. This indeed comes after another historical night uh, for its Squid Game's cast and crew uh, at the 20th uh, Screen Actors uh, Guild Awards, that is. Now, ABC described the wins at, at these awards as historic as Squid Games became the first non English language series to take home awards in the best acting categories. Besides, actress Chong ho yan and actor Lee jung jae's wins. Squid Game also won the award for outstanding performance by a stunt ensemble in a television series. And in the meantime, U.S. Magazine pointed out that Squid Game earned a place in Hollywood history with wins in nearly every category that it was nominated for on Sunday. And as to why the show had become such a global phenomenon, director Hwang Dong-hyuk earlier spoke to Variety Magazine saying the show had successfully allowed viewers to connect and empathize with the plight of the characters in the series through its various themes and plot devices. All right, Song Yan, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. The pleasure is mine. South Africa shared its discovery of Omicron with the World Health Organization on November 24th last year. It's been 100 days since then, and in our panel discussion on this Thursday, we touch upon related events here in Korea and over in England. For more, I have Dr. Kim Sing-tek from Institute Pasture Korea. Welcome back, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. I also have David Cox live on the line. David, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thanks for having us here again. Right, Dr. Kim, we'll start here. The daily tally here in Korea appears to be rising faster than earlier forecasts. How do you explain its accelerated pace? Well, as you talk, just uh, we are still just in the face of just the increasing number of just the total infections, and then the uh, the, the speed of the escalation is a little bit faster than we uh, uh, anticipated earlier, and I think a number of just the variables actually affected uh, the speed. Well, the first one is actually last week uh, our government actually extended some business hours from uh, nine to just uh, ten, and then some uh, actually just experts were a little bit just uh, concerned about the uh, the kind of just, uh, the the extension of the business hours. I, I don't know 
know exactly how much actually that actually affect the uh, this uh, total increase. And then secondly, now we are in just in the middle of just a uh, sort of national just a uh, uh, presidential election campaign. So the, in the end, I mean, just the people are just uh, tend to just get together just before some this kind of a bit of the political just a big event. And then probably this is uh, some uh, what the two just a uh, major uh, variable that actually affect the uh, our just the current status of this escalating number of just uh, total infections. Right. Uh, David, what, meanwhile, can you tell us about the COVID-19 situation over in England following its Omicron peak in early January? Yes, so at the moment we have about 45,000 cases in the UK. It's definitely much less than early January, which is great. We've seen a little bit of a rise. There's a new sub-variant of Omicron called um, BA2, and that's been causing a little bit of a rise in cases. Um, but um, a pretty much like we've seen like a, a very slight increase in hospitalizations, but it's, it's nothing compared to, say, last year at the height of the second wave in the UK. So at the moment, the healthcare system is coping pretty much OK with COVID. So the vaccines have made obviously a massive difference and we have the antiviral pills so all of that has been has been helping right that is good to know and dr kim what can be concluded more or less about omicron itself given the information uh, disclosed thus far well, the, as you just said earlier, the Omicron just a variant was actually reported from the South Africa to WHO last uh, November last year, and uh, since then, uh, well, there was a, this actually virus has just a predominant just the, the virus just globally, and then there are some uh, now just we have uh, very well just aware of this virus just uh, the, compared to just uh, the earlier just time point, and then well, when uh, whenever actually just uh, this kind of variant appears, the people and the experts are concerned about the, how transmissible this virus viruses and also how severe the disease this virus can cause. And now we know just a lot of that. Just uh, the first of all, in terms of uh, transmissibility, this virus seems to be just uh, very, very contagious compared to the uh, some other just, uh, prior just uh, the variants. And then in terms of severity, in all the time points, there was some uh, debates whether it, this virus is really just uh, causing severe disease or not. And then one of the actually compounding factors to just uh, inhibiting just uh, such kind of interpretation is that uh, many people these times were actually somehow just immune to the, uh, the, uh, this SARS coronavirus too because of whether it is by the, uh, the vaccination or just by just natural infection. So maybe just our immune, just immune status somehow just uh, make, just, uh, it, uh, make it difficult to just interpret whether this uh, Omicron variant is really just causing severe disease or not. But uh, now in the end, uh, just, uh, every, uh, every expert now just uh, agree that uh, now this virus seems to just cause less severe disease and then the virus seems to replicate mostly in the uh, upper respiratory tract rather than in the lower respiratory and then infection and the replication in the lower respir respiratory tract somehow just correlates with the very severe disease. Especially, this is a case for just a previous, just the, the previous variant of concern. And then the, uh, for this virus, we are also just concerned about some uh, diagnosis and the vaccines and the drugs. Especially of the diagnosis, the uh, one of the key feature of this Omicron variant was that the, actually our just actually standard, just a golden standard of diagnosis is just a PCR. And then for the PCR, generally we amplified three different regions of the, the, the this coronavirus uh, the genome. And then one uh, the area is the uh, the called the, the the spike gene. And then in the case of this uh, diagnosis. The, the amplification of this uh, spike gene was actually just uh, actually just missing, and uh, this is was actually just a key feature of the when we actually discovered the uh, this uh, the Omicron variant. Now the, uh, the domestic companies and others now we have a very good system, the, not just only just detecting the virus. Now we can actually discern the, which kind of variant is actually just infecting just a specific person. So that's kind of some progress. And in terms of the vaccine. Well, unfortunately, the, the, the vaccine actually, well, the, there are two main aspects of the, the response by the vaccination. One is the antibody production, and the other is the cell-mediated immunity. Unfortunately, the antibody, which is uh, the actually uh, induced by the vaccination, actually do not have any actually just good neutralization just capacity compared to the other just the previous variants. But just by just uh, we actually by just, uh, uh, just administering the, uh, the booster shot, we can actually just uh, just uh, induce 
this way just broad experience, broad just responses in terms of antibody responses. And uh, but uh, thankfully, though we have the very still just a good and the robust and the long lasting just the, the cell mediated immunity, which is very good. And the, the main role of this immunity is actually just the, uh, the blocking the uh, progression to the, uh, the severe disease. And lastly, the uh, just uh, drugs, and then most of drugs, including the Paxlovid, and then uh, Remdesivir, and then Molnupiravir, still very effective against the uh, this Omicron variant. But the uh, one of the uh, concern is that the monoclonal antibodies, the uh, some well, well the uh, regional monoclonal antibody, and then the uh, Eli Lilly, and even the Korean the Celtic antibody, did not show any just good neutralizing capacity against this Omicron variant. One. Uh, Potentially, just the one exception is the, uh, the antibody uh, developed by the uh, GSK and the BFI technology. That show still just uh, retains the uh, neutralizing capacity of it, uh, against uh, this Omicron. Right, I see. Mm. Simply speaking, Dr. Kim, could we, uh, could we conclude that Omicron does appear to be milder than previous variants? That's for sure. Right, I see. Meanwhile, David, I believe all pandemic-related restrictions have been lifted over in England as of last Thursday. What has been the public response to that? Yes, so we have entered a new phase in the pandemic in the UK, the government's big living with COVID strategy. I mean, I think most people are relieved. Um, pandemic fatigue has definitely been a big thing here over in the UK. I mean, the most people who are maybe still at risk are people with weakened health systems, people with, you know, suffering from like sort of autoimmune conditions or people like so who've kind of been through chemotherapy, things like that. Um, but I think the main concern at the moment is because there's been the end of free testing, which is, is coming up in scientists and doctors are worried that we're going to lose track of the virus, particularly the emergence of new variants, because we're going to, for now, we're going to be relying on the, on basically kind of COVID surveys, which probably are going to be, so if any new variant does emerge, we'll find out about it about two weeks later than we say we'll do at the moment. So I think that's the only real concern right now. Right. So as you mentioned, free COVID-19 tests, David, will end on the 1st of April. Is there an exception, though? What about healthcare workers or those at risk? Can they still receive free testings? Um, yes, so I think basically within hospitals and also within care homes and things like that, there still are going to be dedicated testing programs. And I think some private companies as well might introduce their own lots of testing programs for their employees because they, I think the one problem with the end of free testing is people are a little bit unsure about what to do because the symptoms of Omicron, particularly once you've been vaccinated, are very similar to if you say have an ordinary cold. So it's quite hard to know if, say, you're going to be putting vulnerable people maybe in your family or in the workplace at risk so people aren't quite sure what to do about that but I think companies particularly big companies are going to respond by introducing their own testing regimes and and definitely within hospitals right the legal requirement David for isolating or mandatory isolation that is in the case of a COVID-19 patient is also going to be lifted what is the response to that are there any concerns there are, I think, mean, there are like some concerns, particularly I think from people whose families are, you know, vulnerable and obviously the elderly as well. But the government has responded by that by basically introducing a, a full vaccine, which is going to be rolled out to over 75s in April. So I think that's kind of the government's way of essentially trying to ensure that the vulnerable people in the country are still protected, even though we are relaxing these restrictions by introducing more vaccines. Right. And staying with restrictions, Dr. Kim, here in Korea, social restrictions include a 10 p.m. curfew for di drinking and dining establishments and a cap of six people for social gatherings. How effective are these restrictions at this particular point in our fight against the pandemic, especially in the absence of other containment efforts like contact tracing or close contact isolation? Well, first of all, I have to add that one, one thing that uh, actually just the Omicron variant is uh, relatively just uh, milder than the other just the pre previous just uh, variant, but it's not Omicold. It is still just uh, could be dangerous for the unvaccinated people and then the people with the, uh, some high risk group. So vaccination is very important. And that the, regarding the, your question, I think uh, the, there seems to be some uh, confusion because uh, the, some uh, local just, uh, the district courts actually just it actually judges very different just uh, the rules against the uh, some authorities. So then that actually just causes some confusion among the uh, some the people. And then the, I think uh, there was some. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, kind of just confusion, but uh, one of the just the background is that now just people believe that uh, now many people are somehow just immune to the uh, the virus, whether it is just by the vaccination and also just uh, just natural infection. But then the uh, 
uh, there were not just uh, this time, but uh, very early in the not just early, very uh, sometimes just uh, last last year. Many people actually also argue that uh, maybe now we once we just obtained a very just uh, well just a, a, maybe just some some uh, maximum just a vaccination rate among the uh, some general people. Then now what about just uh, we just uh, just lift up all the uh, just mandates because now the kind of just responsibility is just uh, shifted from the government to the, the personals. The in, sorry, individuals, and then the, the those individuals who chose not to be vaccinated should get just responsibility. But those are just one of the opinions, and then the, I think when, in terms of just government side, the government should just still just be very careful about just the protecting very just the high risk groups, especially on the some uh, the, the the elderly people, and then with the some uh, the underlying just medical conditions. As my colleague Po Gyeong mentioned mm. earlier, Dr. Kim, authorities are thinking about lifting social restrictions earlier than their date of expiration, which comes on the 13th of this March. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think that's one of the, the, the possible scenarios. And then the government is actually just anticipating how many just infections will just occur in the near future. And then how many just the, uh, the severe cases will just occur based on the uh, some experiences in other countries and then the vaccination rate, rate things like that. And then the, one of the things is that the government now just is only just focus on the severe cases and then also some high risk groups. And then what the, the things that we can actually implement it right now is that uh, just giving just a booster shot for those people, and also just uh, just uh, giving just uh, the, uh, the, uh, the giving the uh, drugs as soon as possible when they are actually diagnosed as just positive for just COVID-19. So that's one kind one the, the thing that actually government can just uh, take. Right, I see. And David, what has been the pattern of infection over in England since the lifting of all restrictions last week, would you say? I understand it's too early because you only have a week, but then has there been any tangible retreat or perhaps a rebound in infections, would you say? There's been a slight rebound in infections, definitely. I think it's gone up by about maybe 11% in the last few weeks, but it's hard to tell whether that's anything to do with re removal of restrictions or whether it's just the new Omicron subvariant, which is much more infectious even than Omicron itself, which has just become dominant in the UK. So that is the question at the moment. Right. And Dr. Kim, is Korea's healthcare system capable of coping with COVID-19 caseloads in the absence of social restrictions? Well, uh, the uh, the thing uh, that that's actually what I just uh, talked just a little bit just earlier, and then the uh, just uh, our just uh, the focus. Is, and anyway, we have actually shifted it, not just the managing. I mean, just the controlling the number of just the total case numbers, but the government actually already just shifted to the uh, managing total number of the severe COVID-19. So, as long as uh, we are vaccinated, the governments and then also experts agree that uh, as long as we are just vaccinated, now the uh, this uh, Omicron variant is the actually just the risk level is is almost the same as the influenza viruses so this we can actually just deal with actually that's the what the the kind of the basis that the government actually decide the what to pursue in the future Right. And David, come March 15th, the legal requirement for health and social care workers to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 will end in England. Do tell us a bit about the background behind this measure and, of course, the public response to it. Yes, so this measure was introduced back in November. It was very, very controversial at the time. Um, people in the UK are very opposed against any kinds of mandates regarding vaccination. And there were a lot of fears that the result of it would basically mean that a lot of people would simply leave the care or like the hospital sector. Um, so now, like, so it, now that it's been removed, um, there's it's a lot of people are very happy about that. Um, the question is essentially whether people who left the care sector because of that will come back again. Like no one, no one quite knows. But um, I think within like so the uh, the health worker sector, like so there's a lot of people who are very happy that the the mandate restriction is being removed. Right. And staying with vaccination, David, would you say the public in England has adequate vaccination coverage to protect it, let's say, from future variants? Um, I think at the moment the vaccination picture in the UK is quite good. Uh, I think about 73% are fully vaccinated and about 56% have had a booster shot. So the vaccination coverage is reasonable and particularly at the moment um, it's, we've often seen through Omicron that children who haven't been vaccinated have been one of the most vulnerable groups. But in the past few weeks we've just started vaccinating the 5 to 11 year olds. Um, so at the moment I think the vaccination picture is quite good, although obviously it's always hard to tell if like another 
other variant comes along which is more capable of making breakthrough infections. But right now we've seen, I think, that vaccines have really held Omicron at bay because as Dr. Kim said, for people who are not vaccinated, Omicron can be a very severe illness. But I think it's a good picture of the vaccination scenario in the country that even with the rise of Omicron, we haven't seen that big an uptake in hospitalizations or deaths or anything at all in the last few months. Right. And on the subject of variants, Dr. Kim, what more has been shared about the so-called stealth Omicron that both my uh, colleagues and David mentioned earlier? Well, the first I have to say the uh, the name just as test Omicron was actually derived from the the fact that uh, this uh, uh, when we actually try the, uh, the the standard just the PCR test, this test Omicron is not actually uh, distinguishable from the uh, the sort of just original just Omicron, and it also it's not easy to distinguish from the uh, some uh, Delta variant. So then the the one of the way that we can actually identify whether this virus is from the uh, test Omicron or not is just as the sequencing, and it is it, it would be actually just costly and then just take time to before just judging whether it is the stealth Omicron or not. But as I said earlier, whenever just any just a, just a variant it appears, we are actually concerned about the transmissibility and also the, the severity. But in terms of transmissibility, although Omicron is uh, much transmissible, much more just transfer contagious compared to the, uh, the previous prayer variant, but this uh, BA2, the stealth Omicron, seems to be more uh, transmissible than the, uh, the original this, uh, uh, the Omicron. And which, which in terms of just virology, this virus seems to be more fit and uh, compared to just the Omicron and then just other just uh, the previous uh, the variants. So the, it is quite just possible and then we're actually expecting this uh, stealth Omicron would just probably replace the, uh, the, 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 the current just the Omicron with the, uh, this uh, stealth Omicron in the near future. And, but uh, thankfully, in terms of the severity, this virus seems to be, uh, seems to cause very uh, similar level of just the severe, well, the severe disease compared to the Omicron. So uh, this is not a real concern at this moment, although there was some uh, conflicting just the uh, data from other countries, but as of now, the, we are somehow just uh, uh, just agree that the severity is very similar to Omicron. And then once the uh, the person is uh, infected by the Omicron, the person would have just a very uh, good just uh, uh, level of just uh, protection in terms of just neutralizing antibody and then some uh, cell mediated immunity. Also, even just by the the uh, not not for the, uh, for the uh, uninfected people, that once they uh, got just on the booster shot, they will have very good just the protection against uh, this uh, stealth Omicron as well. And also in terms of uh, diagnosis and then the vaccines and drugs, Diagnosis, as I told you, just uh, it was actually a little bit difficult compared to the uh, stealth Omicron. And then, the, uh, unless what, what, what we do some uh, the real just uh, sequencing uh, the analysis, and for the vaccine, the efficacy of the vaccine is, I think, is almost uh, very similar compared to the Omicron variant. And then, in terms of the uh, drugs, well, the one of the addition uh, for this uh, stealth Omicron is that. The one of the uh, actually the only just a monoclonal antibody that was still just retained just a neutralizing activity against the Omicron that was actually Sotrovimab. But this uh, Sotrovimab actually uh, lost actually much of this uh, neutralizing activity against the, this uh, stealth Omicron, stealth Omicron. So that was actually a major difference compared to the uh, some earlier just Omicron variant and now that we are seeing. Right, but regardless of that, the stealth Omicron is as mild and as the current Omicron. That's right. All right, Dr. Kim, as always, thank you very mm -hmm. much for your thoughts today. Mm -hmm. And David, over in the UK, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Right, well, that is all the time we have for today. Do join us again tomorrow. That would be Friday for more coverage. Thank you for now.